Thanks everybody for coming. So this is a presentation we put together for the Science on Saturday program in Livermore and we're giving you the same presentation here. Uh, besides Megan and myself, Erin McKay, a high school teacher from Tracy, was also involved in putting this together. She couldn't be here today. Marvelous machines. What we are talking about today are marvelous machines and the two types of marvelous machines. One is really huge. It's like two miles long. It's an X-ray laser. The other ones are molecular machines. They're really, really tiny. They have some nanometers in size. We'll get to what a nanometer is later. Uh, kind of protein machines that perform functions in, in the body, in the cell. And we use one, the large machine, the X-ray laser, to study the function of the small machines. Uh, first, a little geography. Um, so the big machine, the X-ray laser, we're talking about today is called LCLS. It is at Slack National Accelerator Lab, which is in the, in the South Bay. It's close to Stanford. It's actually operated by Stanford University. And there's a satellite image that shows San Francisco, San Jose, and where LCLS and Slack are located. There's also a little more circle, because that's where we are. And then Modesto is a little off to the side, another 40 miles east uh, of Livermore. So what is LCLS? Um, it stands actually for Linear Coherent Light Source. And the name itself is not important. It's, it's an X-ray laser that study, it's used to study materials and biological structures, in particular very small biological structures. So the first question we wanted to talk about is why, why do we even care about structure? Why do we want to study structure? And there's a paradigm in biology, it's a structure function paradigm, which says that usually the structure of a biological object has something to do with its function. So uh, if you look at the picture of the fanny fox, it has huge ears that look like large antennas that resemble a satellite dish. And you could imagine that you know, these, these large ears are to capture sound waves and, make the, and, and help the fox hear really well. Um, we also have structure function connections in the micro world. Here's a, it's just a, a computer generated image of a bacterium with a cello. Um, and just looking at a static picture, you might wonder what are these little worm-like things that, that stick out from the bacteria. Um, and of course we know from, from previous work that these things are there to, to make the bacteria move around. Now, we wish this was a real movie taken with this microscopy, but it's actually computer generated. Because these things are so small that we, we can't really um, image, image things and make movies on that scale with normal light. And we'll get to why we, you know, why we need x-rays to do that for small things. Uh, before I go on, I want to actually talk a little about what micro and nano mean. Most of you probably know that. But I've been talking very loosely about micro world and nano world. Um, in science, we measure lengths, not in feet or inches. We measure it in meters. So a meter, I forgot my meter stick, but I've got a, a tape. Um, a meter is a little more than three feet. Now, that's about a meter, and a hundredth of a meter is a centimeter, and a thousandth of a meter is a millimeter. So that's indicated in that, in that slide here. On the left is really large things, kilometers, which are you know, city blocks, cities, uh, meters, the size of a human, I'm about you know, one meter, 80. A fly is about a centimeter, a cell, some micrometers. Um, interestingly, I think you, you watch a movie later, that's uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, right? And the kids become really small. Um, they are supposedly about five millimeters in this movie, so they're about the size of a fly or a little smaller on this scale. So as, although they're shrunk and very small, they're still much, much larger than the objects we really um, care about here that we want to talk about today. So if you go beyond a micrometer, a thousandth of a micrometer is a nanometer. A nanometer is about the size of DNA, a protein molecule. A virus, maybe 50 to 100 nanometers, influenza virus, for example, is about 100 nanometers in size. Um, they're hard to see with, with normal microscopy. And then if you go further down that scale, you get to an atom, which is uh, an angstrom, a tenth of a, a nanometer. And the atomic nucleus is, is even smaller. That just gives you a, a rough scale of um, objects we're interested in. And so here, particularly, we're interested in molecular machines that are made of proteins or nucleic acids or things like that. So we're talking about the 1 to 10 nanometer size scale. And I think uh, Megan is going to tell us a little more about proteins. All right. So 
why do we care about the structure of these tiny objects, proteins? Well, aside from composing a relatively large portion of your body mass, they perform all kinds of different functions physiologically in your body. Uh, hemoglobin, which is in your blood, carries oxygen all throughout your body through the circulatory system. Uh, calcium pumps replenish important ions that are depleted during muscle contractions. Alpha amylase, uh, which is in your saliva, breaks up long chains of carbohydrates into simple sugars. And antibodies um, protect the body from infection. So these are just a couple of examples of the over 30,000 unique proteins in your body that each have a very specific function. So just like the fennec fox or the bacterius flagella, the function of these, these proteins is super dependent on the shape that they have. So let's take a little step back and look at how proteins get their shape in the first place. Okay, so what is a protein anyway? Well, despite the diversity of the tasks they perform, all proteins are made up of the same 21 building blocks called amino acids. These all have sort of generally the same structure, but they have slightly different side chains. Proteins are actually chains of usually hundreds of these amino acids. DNA provides instructions on the order and type of uh, members of the chain, the order and type of amino acids, that are then bound together through what are called peptide bonds. These peptide bonds form the core of the chain, uh, sometimes called the protein backbone, and the amino acid side chains kind of stick out from that. Depending on the type and order of amino acids, the protein chain then folds in on itself into a very specific and unique structure. A structure is sometimes represented like this, where each one of these spheres is a different atom within the uh, amino acids that make up the protein. So, what good is knowing the structure? What, what does it do us? Well, so here's an example um, that some of you guys might be familiar with. So, antibiotic resistant bacteria are a huge problem in hospitals today. Sometimes they're called superbugs. Um, because these bacteria have figured out how to take antibiotics that we use to treat um, microbe infections and make them totally ineffective. So we don't have any more tools to, to treat disease that uh, depends on these bugs. So we know that some of these microbes make proteins called beta-lactamases. Those are shown here in blue. Um, and we know that somehow the protein binds onto the antibiotics and somehow makes them not work anymore. But we don't really know from a picture like this what the chemical details of how that happens are. If we have the structure, then we can see that there's a little kind of divot, like a pocket, on the surface of the protein that the antibiotic perfectly fits into. If we look a little bit closer, we can see that the beta-lactamase holds the antibiotic tightly in the pocket using these two zinc ions. Um, and while it's held there, the protein can break it up um, into pieces that no longer, ooh, no longer uh, function as an antibiotic. So with this kind of information, um, we can maybe design a different kind of antibiotic that doesn't, um, that doesn't, sorry, having some mic issues here. <laughs> we can design a different kind of antibiotic that doesn't bind into the protein in this way. Maybe it has a slightly different shape. Um, or we could even bind an inhibitor that binds more tightly than our antibiotic does blocking the pocket and preventing the medicine from binding in and getting broken apart. But sometimes uh, just the structure of a protein is not really enough to tell you the whole story about how it functions. So this is this blue protein here is a, called a calcium pump. It's a membrane protein that, um, that sits in a cell membrane, shown here in white, and it's kind of forming a bridge between the one side of the cell membrane to the inside of the cell. Um, its function is to um, transport calcium from outside the membrane in um, using chemical energy from a small molecule called ATP. 
But based on this sort of static picture, it's not really obvious how that happens. Um, and we need more information to really get into detail about how this protein works. So here, you can see that the protein functions through a series of almost mechanical motions. You know, opening and closing and allowing calcium to come through the membrane. But unfortunately, what we have here is it's sort of an artist's, it's like a, an animation, an artist's animation um, of how we think the protein moves as it goes in between a couple of structures that we know it can have. Um, this doesn't really, I mean, if we don't measure this motion, we don't really know how it happens. So this is kind of an assumption. It's like, you know, you know the protein starts off like this and ends up like this, then you can say, okay, probably it moves like this. But unless you actually measure that, then it could easily, you know, do something like this and just wind up there eventually. We don't know unless we measure. So to really um, get into detail about how these things work, we need to measure not just structure, but also motion. Okay. So how do we measure structure and motion in a protein? Um, well, if we want to measure structure in a macroscopic object, like your eye, you can take a picture, right? And if you want to measure how that object moves through time, you take a movie. Hey. Uh, so in order to kind of get an idea of how we might approach making a movie of a molecule, um, you can kind of use the analogy of movies of macroscopic objects. And in fact, the first movie that was ever made was made to answer a question about how a structure moves through time. So that question was how do horses run, right? So in 1872, uh, a guy named Leland Stanford, who you may know of from the university, uh, he went to photographer Edward Boybridge and asked him to settle a debate. So the question was, during a horse's gallop, is there ever a point where all four hooves are in the air at once, or do they always leave one foot on the ground at any given time? This actually like, wasn't known at the time because the human eye can't discern motion that fast. So Moybridge took his cameras and he went down to the Palo Alto racetrack, which is actually not that far from where Slack is today. Um, and he rigged up a series of tripwire cameras. So as the horse galloped past each camera, her name was Sally, by the way, um, Sally would trigger the tripwire and uh, cause the camera to take a picture. So these snapshots became the frames in Moybridge's movie, from which you can clearly see that there are definitely times when all four, four hooves are in the air, right? So this settled a, a real question people had about how structures move. So the question is, how do we translate this to the kinds of movies we want to make on like the nanoscale, um, tiny objects like proteins? So first, in order to make a movie, you need frames. You need pictures to put into sequence. And if you want to take a picture of a microscopic, uh, microscopic, micro, microscopic, sure, microscopic, microscopic object, you generally use a microscope, right? Um, but when we get into really, really tiny objects on the sub-micron to nanometer scale, we run into a problem. So this is an image of an ulcer in, a, in the lining of a human stomach, in this case caused by a bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. This is actually the same bacteria that we saw earlier in the talk. He uses his flagella to swim around human stomachs and cause problems. Um, so here you can pretty clearly see the stomach cells in blue. Uh, you can kind of see their membranes and maybe some organelles and some details in there. But when it comes to H. pylori, who is in this red circle, just looks like a bunch of dark blips. Like, you don't really see him in any kind of detail, and you definitely don't see a flagella swimming around, right? So, why is there this limitation on using visible light to take a movie of something on this super small scale? 
Well, to answer that question, we need the perspective of a physicist, so I'm going to have Matthias come back to the stage. Okay, thank you. Yeah, why, why can't you see really, really small things through a microscope? Um, the answer to the question has to do with the fact that optical light is actually um, an electromagnetic wave, and a wave is characterized, among other things, with a, a wavelength. And um, in physics we know that it, it becomes hard to see things that are of the size of a wavelength or smaller than wavelengths because things become fuzzy, fuzzy there's a uh, diffraction effects happening. Um, and that's kind of indicated in this, um, in this picture. So red light is relatively long wavelengths, blue light is a shorter wavelength, so when you look at smaller objects that are on a micrometer scale, they're usually a little more focused or more, more sharp in, in the blue. But if the objects get smaller and smaller, even blue light, or why that light is not, doesn't have wavelengths that's short enough to see that. Um, here's a graph that, that describes wavelengths. So electromagnetic waves span actually a huge range of wavelengths. There's um, you know, very long wavelengths, meters and even kilometers. Um, we're talking about radio waves there. Um, um, like 100, 100 megahertz on the FM radio, that's a wavelength of so about three meters. Right, then there's a microwaves, uh, millimeter waves, and microwaves, and let me get into the infrared where wavelengths is some micrometers. The range of visible light is, is actually very, very small. So what we can see ranges from about 0.4 micrometers to about 0 0.7, 0 0.75 micrometers. So it's a very, very small range that's, that's visible, and we see that from, from red to blue. Um, on the blue end of the spectrum comes the violet and ultraviolet light. We know about ultraviolet light being emitted by the sun, and if it's you know, hitting the skin without uh, any protection, you might get a sunburn. If you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, you ultimately uh, come into the X-ray region. So X-rays are typically uh, have wavelengths typically of you know, a nanometer or tens of a nanometer. So mention that if you want to image or look at an object of a certain size, you have to use an electromagnetic wave with a wavelength that's not longer than the object is large. We want something that's a little shorter. So we are interested in viruses and proteins and DNA, which are in a size range of 100 nanometers down to about one nanometer, which means we want to use light electromagnetic waves with a wavelength of about a nanometer or tens of a nanometer. And that gets us um, to x-rays. So everybody is probably familiar with x-rays, right? They were discovered by, by William Conrad Röntgen at the end of the 1800s. Uh, he found that X-rays are very penetrating, they're invisible, but X-rays um, somehow can blacken photographic film, so you can actually take images with X-rays. And one of the first images he took was actually an image of the hand of his wife with a ring. And that's a very famous picture. Uh, you see the bones, you see the ring. This is actually a negative. By the way, X-rays hit the film, the film becomes black, where the bones prevent X-rays from penetrating and going through to the film. The film stays white. Um, then when you convert the negative into a positive image, you see that image that's here on the screen. Uh, modern imaging has come, modern X-ray imaging has come a very long way. Uh, people have developed this method much, much further. Uh, there's not only standard medical imaging where you have a film, or maybe now nowadays it's a, it's a detector that detects, an imaging detector that detects uh, X-rays that penetrate. You can also do X-ray imaging from various angles, and then use a computer to derive the three-dimensional structure of the object. It's called X-ray tomography, and I think the picture of the fly in the middle is, is taken by X-ray tomography. And what you can see is you can see very, very fine details on, on these objects with X-rays that you uh, could not see as easily with optical light. So for these larger objects, you can, you can do direct imaging, meaning what I mean with this is you have an X-ray source that shines X-rays onto the object like a hand, and you have a detector. Yeah, originally it was a photographic film, nowadays it's solid state detectors, almost like the, the you know, CCD detectors like in your, in your cell phone camera, just a little larger area. And then X-rays that penetrate the object uh, get absorbed depending on the density in the object. You know, bones are more dense than, than the flesh and the space in between your fingers. Um, so you basically measure the absorption of X-rays in the object that gives you some contrast between the dense and the not-so-dense parts. Um, that works very well. 
when the objects are relatively large and when there's differences in density and differences in X-ray absorption. But if you want to do the same thing on a nanoscale, let's say you want to image a, a cell or a bacterium or a protein complex, um, we can't do that. Uh, for for one, one practical reason is that the objects are so small that they don't absorb X-rays very much. So there's, there's no contrast, right? All, pretty much all the X-rays go through that tiny object because the absorption is not there. So you won't see um, any, any differences in, in, in density. The other issue is, of course, that your object is smaller than a pixel on your camera. So you won't have a, you can't create an image with a camera where the, where the pixel size is larger than the object. Now there's a trick, um, we, there's a workaround that we can use, and it's uh, relying on scattered X-rays. So of all the X-rays that go into an object, even a, a microscopic object, a few of them will actually scatter off electrons in the object and bounce off uh, at, at larger angles and be scattered away from that, from that direct beam that goes through. Uh, it's also called X-ray diffraction. And it turns out those scattered X-rays actually contain um, the angles in which direction these X-rays are scattered contain information about the structure of your microscopic object. So that's what we're using in, in X-ray imaging of really, really tiny images. It's actually X-ray diffraction imaging. And the important point here is that a, a diffraction image of an object is not really a, like an absorption image where you see the structure of the object. It's, it's a fairly complex image that you can <coughs> has the structural information encoded, so you don't see the structure directly. Um, on the top right is a diffraction image of a virus. You see the icosahedral uh, shape of that virus, and the, the diffraction image has really not much to do with the actual shape of the virus. Also, the symmetry of the icosahedron is kind of reflected in the symmetry of the diffraction image. For a protein molecule, when you have a lot of protein molecules arranged in the protein crystal, the diffraction pattern is actually a pattern of many, many, many uh, little uh, points called black spots. And then you have to use mathematical algorithms to extract the structural information out of this diffraction image. So there's one other problem um, with X-rays, which is they, they're fairly energetic uh, radiation, so they tend to uh, produce X-ray damage. What I mean with this is that um, X-rays interacting with matter will ionized atoms that will knock out electrons, uh, produce chemical radicals that then start chemical reactions that will degrade the object you want to image. So if you want to use x-rays for imaging and you want to get a really, really, really good image and you put more and more x-rays into the object, you actually start damaging the object you want to image. Um, one workaround in that that has been very successful in the last three decades is called x-ray crystallography. The idea is you want, to, you want to measure the structure of a single protein molecule, but in order to get enough diffraction of the single molecule, um, you would have to put so many X-rays into the molecule that the molecule would get damaged. So what you do is you take a lot of identical molecules and put them in a regular array. It's called a crystal. And then the radiation damage is spread out over many. So each, each molecule scatters only a few of the X-rays at most. And then all the scattering of all the molecules in the crystal together produces a diffraction signal, a pattern that has a lot of structural information in it. So this is called um, protein crystallography. Uh, sometimes when people do protein crystallography, they go a step further. They um, cool the protein crystal, which also slows down the, the, the damage. So you can get even better diffraction images of protein crystals when they're cold. Um, a disadvantage, of course, is that when you freeze a protein, it doesn't move anymore. So it's hard to do dynamical measurements how a protein moves when you have a frozen crystal. Um, but overall, I mentioned that uh, X-ray crystallography has been, has been hugely successful. So you have a protein whose structure you are interested in. You produce the protein, you purify it, you find a way to make it form a crystal. Not all proteins form with crystal, but some do. And then you put that crystal, the protein crystal, in an X-ray beam, and you get this, these, these very complex diffraction patterns, yeah, shown in the middle with all these, these little crack spots. And then all these spots together, the position of the spots and the intensity of the spots, encode the structural information about this molecule, and then you can you know, use some algorithms to, to reconstruct um, the, the actual structure. 
So this was hugely successful in the last 30 years. Um, here's a graph that shows the number of protein structures deposited in the protein data bank, which is one of the most thing everybody, all the researchers in the world, uh, put their, their structures they measure into this protein data bank to share it. <coughs> um, this is a number of structures that have been deposited as a function of time. And you see it kind of started out in the mid-90s, which was actually coinciding with um, a new type of X-ray source becoming available at that time, called a synchrotron. And then there was this explosive growth of, of known structures, and I think to date we know about, we have about 140,000 structures in that protein data bank. Those are not only proteins from humans, those are proteins from animals, from bacteria, from plants. It's, it's a large number, but it's also a large number of species that are, are represented there. So this is all good, right? But there's one problem, and I mentioned that briefly earlier, that not all proteins really form nice protein crystals that you can use for protein crystallography. Now, why is that? There's a particular class of protein, it's actually a very important class of protein, it's called a mem membrane protein, that doesn't crystallize very easily. Membrane proteins are proteins that are embedded or anchored in cellular membranes, either the external membrane or inter uh, intracellular membranes. And um, across the membranes are anchored in that. And membrane proteins are usually large protein complexes that perform very complex functions in a cell, uh, involved in metabolism and signaling and many other things. So it's a very important class of proteins. And about 30% of all proteins are thought to be membrane proteins. So when we go back to this plot and look at this, this huge number of protein structures we know, um, people realize there's only 0.6% of those structures are actually structures of membrane proteins. Membrane proteins make up 30% of the proteins, but only 0.6% of the known structures. <coughs> so this is a big problem that was obviously um, realized by protein crystallographers and structural biologists uh, for a long time that there's a, a huge bottleneck in getting to structures of membrane proteins, which are the most interesting kinds of proteins. And then about almost 20 years ago, um, people were scratching their heads and thinking, well, how can we overcome this, this bottleneck and uh, what can we do? And uh, the idea was proposed to, to outrun the damage. So I mentioned to you, you can, cannot expose your object you want to image to too much X-ray radiation because it starts damaging your object, it starts literally frying your, your protein. Um, but these damage processes take a certain time to, to occur and so what people ask at that time is can you, can you have a very, very intense but extremely short X-ray pulse to get the structural information, to get the diffraction amount before that molecule actually flies apart. Um, and this was later dubbed diffraction before destruction. And there was a seminal paper published in Nature in the year 2000 by a small group of people who actually went through some molecular dynamics simulations and some calculations about how many intense an X-ray pulse would you need for this and how short would the pulse have to be. Right? Because you, the moment you put X-rays in, the damage processes start occurring. So you have to have a pulse that's, that's very, very, very short. And their answer was in the paper, yeah, probably about 10 to 100 femtoseconds. Now femto is it's not even the word we've used so far, right? Where we had millimeter, na micrometer, nanometer, and, and femto is actually much further down. And I think Megan will talk to us about femtoseconds. Okay. So, what is a femtosecond? We normally don't really hear that prefix because it is an extreme amount of powers of 10. It's difficult for us to really conceive of how short that really is. It's 0 0.00000000000001 seconds. So to get some perspective on what that actually means, uh, let's think about light. Literally the fastest thing that we know of. So in one second, light travels a massive distance. It's about the distance between the Earth and the Moon, uh, which is 186,000 miles. 
but in one femtosecond, light only travels 0.3 micron, which is less than 1% of the diameter of a human hair. So just to give you an idea of scale. I think, I, back of the envelope calculation, I decided that in one femtosecond, light travels two thicknesses of the fingernail of the kids that are shrunk, and honey, I shrunk the kids. <laughs> Something like that. Don't quote me on that. Um, so to get an idea of what these super short pulses mean for collecting diffraction, from easily damaged samples, we have a little video. To obtain images of very small living organisms, such as cyanobacteria, scientists can use X-ray pulses and a technique called X-ray diffraction. First, cyanobacteria in an aerosol form are placed into the path of an X-ray pulse. The pulse collides with the bacteria, and the photons that make up the pulse scatter. With more common X-ray tools, Radiation from an X-ray pulse will damage and destroy the bacterium before scientists can get a clear image. But if the pulse is extremely short, the photons can outrun the damage and scatter before the bacterium is destroyed. Finally, the scattered photons are collected on a detector. Scientists can then use the pattern on the detector to reconstruct the image of the cell. Okay, so using these ultra-short, ultra-bright pulses from this theoretical X-ray source, X-ray lasers, um, a strategy was developed to do a new kind of diffraction experiment. Because there are so many photons in every pulse, that means that you can get a recognizable diffraction image that a computer can process in one single pulse. But because there are so many photons, the sample gets damaged. So the thought was, okay, let's replenish the sample in between each X-ray pulse. to have a constant stream of sample coming into the path of the X-ray beam. So using some sort of jet or spray or what have you, that means the sample will come in at random orientations into the path of the beam. So each one of the many, many diffraction images that you then collect uh, represents a slightly different angle. It looks slightly different. So you take thousands and thousands of these diffraction images and using clever algorithms you can put them all together um, and in theory reconstruct a structure. And in principle this should work for not only crystals, like small microcrystals of proteins, um, but also single molecules, single proteins, and even like other kinds of objects like viruses. So this seemed like a crazy idea in 2000 that such an experiment would even be possible, but uh, it helped make the case to build an instrument like this. And a little over, let's see, just under 10 years ago in 2009, um, LCLS was opened in our backyard in the Bay Area over at Slack National Lab. So let's take a look at that machine. The Slack National Accelerator Laboratory is located in the heart of California's beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. Operated by Stanford University for the U.S. Department of Energy, Slack has been home to the world's longest particle accelerator for nearly 50 years. In 2009, Slack ushered in a new era in its long history of physics research with a new kind of laser called the Linux Coherent Light Source, or LCLS. The LCLS is the first laser in the world to produce hard X-rays, which can be used to see down to the level of atoms and molecules. Adding almost half a mile onto the original two-mile-long accelerator facility, the LCLS uses the final one-third of the accelerator to produce powerful pulses of X-ray laser light Scientists at Slack and around the world will use these powerful beams to create movies about atoms and molecules move and behave on some of the shortest time scales imaginable. The LCLS starts with the drive laser, which generates a precise pulse of ultraviolet light, seen here in red. The drive laser pulse travels down to the injector gun, where it strikes the surface of a copper plate inside the gun. The copper cathode plate responds with a burst of electrons, seen here in blue. 
which are guided into the linear accelerator. Inside the accelerator, the electron bunch encounters the first of two magnetic chicanes, or bunch compressors. These chicanes help even out the arrangement of electrons of different energies in each pulse by sending the pulses along a slight S-curve. The compressed pulse emerges from the chicane and is accelerated further, gaining energy as it travels. The electron bunch then encounters the second bunch compressor. The second bunch compressor is longer than the first because the electrons in the pulse now have even greater energy. The electron pulse continues to the end of the accelerator at nearly the speed of light, finishing the boost phase of its ride at an energy over 12 billion electron volts. The electrons enter the beam transport hall, along which they travel through a series of diagnostic monitors and focusing magnets that help keep the beam precisely shaped and on course. Here, into the undulator hall, the electron pulse enters the heart of the LCLS, where the X-ray laser light is generated. The undulator hall houses a long array of special magnets which comprise thousands of alternating north-south magnetic poles spaced only a few millimeters apart. These alternating poles cause the electron bunch to swerve back and forth in an undulating motion that forces the electrons to give off X-rays. As the electron bunch and X-rays proceed together, they start to interact with each other. The electrons arrange themselves in parallel sheets, causing the X-rays to become in tune with each other or coherent, with an enormous boost in X-ray power. Once the X-ray laser light is generated, the electrons must be safely discarded before the X-rays can be used for experiments. The beam dump uses a powerful electromagnet to divert the electrons down to a special chamber that absorbs the electrons and dissipates their energy. The X-ray pulse unaffected by the pole of the magnets, continues on in the straight line. When fully operational, this entire process will happen up to 120 times per second. The X-ray laser pulse is now ready for scientists to use in one of the six LCLS experimental stations. The experimental instruments each comprise a suite of vacuum chambers, detectors, and sample environments. Each instrument will perform different kinds of experiments, investigating the kinds, arrangements, and motions of the building blocks of matter. For example, the LCLS pulse can be used to make images of single molecules, even though the beam is powerful enough to instantly disintegrate such a tiny sample. Each pulse is so fast that an image is captured in the sliver of time before the molecules can fly apart. Images captured in this way will be strung together frame by frame create the world's first molecular movies of individual biological molecules in action. Cool. Okay, so that video made it look really easy to get the sample in just the right place at just the right time for the X-ray pulse to come and hit it. But in reality, this is actually a huge technical challenge that we've been working on at Livermore uh, for quite some time now. The issue is, flow in too much sample too quickly and you waste everything that flows in between the arrival of X-ray pulses. Flow in too little too slowly and you'll never hit your sample frequently enough to collect enough diffraction data to solve the structure. So, uh, you can also have the opportunity to be frustrated X-ray scientists. Um, our friends at the University of Buffalo made this app called Expel Crystal Blaster that you can download after the movie. Um, and Joanna is going to come and, and give it a shot. Mm -hmm. All right, so a stream of crystals is going to come down from the top of the screen. 
Um, and it will be Joanna's job to fire X-ray pulses to hit the samples as they come, generate diffraction images, and hopefully solve the structure. All right, go Joanna, go. Give a little more volume on the sound. This is, ooh. Yeah, all right, excellent. Oh man, you better up the hit rate, Joanna. Okay, there we go, not bad, you're getting the hang of it. <laughs> You can do it. Uh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Heck yes. You gotta have nimble fingers, Joanna. <laughs> this is actually an admirable hit rate. We we normally have a much lower hit rate than this when we do the experiment. <laughs> When uh, light hits rhodopsin, it changes its shape and sends a signal uh, in a way that the brain can interpret. Yeah, do it. Proceed. Uh, it's also a really nice color. So honestly, when you usually see these structures, it's some false color, but rhodopsin actually is that like nice purple. All right, stage two, photosystem two. This one is harder, actually. Yeah, see, there you go. It's all about the timing, just like in real life. <laughs> yeah, photosystem 2 um, is a photosynthetic protein. It's, uh, yeah, nice. She's on the street, folks. <laughs> it's uh, a protein in green plants. Nice, nice. Nice Good work. It's a protein in green plants that uses the energy of the sunlight to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's responsible for all the breathable oxygen that's in our atmosphere. So, um, really nice structure, Joanna. Good job. Um, let's give her a clap. Thanks. But in reality, it's actually even a little bit more difficult because as a scientist doing this experiment, you don't control when the X-ray pulses come. You only control the sample. So you have to really carefully tune the, your sample stream into the x-ray path and hope that some of the pulses that arrive every 120, or that arrive 120 times a second actually hit something. Um, but when they do hit something, um, we get some amazing structures that you can't really collect in any other way. And Matias is gonna tell us a little bit about some of those results. Okay. Joanna, I clearly practiced since last time. This <laughs> good today. Um, yeah, so LCLS is the world's first hard X-ray free electron laser. It opened in 2009. Um, at first it was slightly lower than maximum energy, 2, 2 kV, that's about, um, that's about half a, half a um, nanometer in wavelengths. So that's not quite short enough to be really high resolution imaging of, of protein molecules. And two years later, it was basically upgraded to a photon energy of about 10, 10 kV, which is about um, 0.1 nanometers, short enough to really get high resolution images. Um, so, and then as soon as this machine opened up, there were you know, large groups of international researchers, including uh, us from Livermore, who were trying to apply this machine to, to some biology problems. At first, you know, the, the biological molecules and objects we used were some whose structure was already known because we needed to show uh, that this method of structure determination using microcrystals or ultimately individual molecules will result in similar structures that are already known from protein crystallography. Um, so this was done in the first year, first two years of, of LCLS, but then very quickly people wanted to apply LCLS to new biological problems, to structures that were unknown, at least partially unknown. And I'm just uh, mentioning one of the early results that but at LCLS that involved a protein called cathepsin B, which is a protein that's associated with sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness is a disease that's carried by a parasite shown in the middle, Tryptanosoma brucei. Um, affects about 60 million people worldwide, about 30,000 die each year, mainly in Africa. And the parasite is, is mainly transmitted by the tsetse fly. So what, what people knew before is they knew part of the structure of conception B, 
And they also knew that um, when the protein gets formed, expressed in the parasite, it doesn't attack the parasite. It doesn't harm the parasite. But the moment it is released into a human, from the parasite into a human, it affects the human and makes the human sick. The question is, why is that? Why does the protein are not active in the parasite? Uh, so, um, our colleagues in, in, in Hamburg, there's a group that, that worked with the protein, they expressed the protein, they made little microcrystals of the protein that we could check, inject into the, into the LCLS beam, and then when the experiment was carried out, um, exactly like the, the video showed, we get many, many diffraction patterns of these microcrystals, and the structure was reconstructed in, you know, Using, using computation. Um, so these cathepsid B microcrystals are about a micrometer in diameter, a few micrometers long. And for this particular experiment, we used about 4 million X-ray shots. And out of these 4 million shots, about 180,000 or so hit the crystals and produced diffraction patterns that were useful for the data analysis. So it's, a, it's about a 5% hit rate or something like that, which was actually not bad. And on the right side is the you know, schematic of how the experiment was set up. We had a, a liquid jet, so the crystals were actually coming in in a, in a very small, very fine focused liquid flow sent through the incoming X-ray beam, and then occasionally an X-ray pulse would hit one of these crystals and produce a diffraction pattern. And this work led to a structure that was actually in some aspects new and different from what people have seen before. And it, it, it kind of explains the, the solution to the, to the, to the puzzle of why, why the protein doesn't attack the parasite. It turns out when the protein is produced in the parasite, it's not only the, the protein, the, the active form of the protein, there's an additional piece to it that it's acting like a safety cap on top of the protein. It's called a pro, propeptide or an inhibitor um, that prevents it from attacking the parasite. And then once this protein is released from the parasite into a human, this cap comes off, the protein becomes active and makes people sick. So this was one of the, if not the first um, real science result that came out of LCLS. This was published in 2000 and early 2013, the experiment was done in 2012, only very short after LCLS was upgraded to the, you know, the full photon energy that we needed for the high resolution structures. Um, very remarkable result. Um, in the following years, there were many other proteins looked at with LCLS and, and static structures determined. Um, but we started out this whole presentation saying, hey, we want to explain you how we make molecular movies using x ray lasers. So, how about movies? How, do you can, how can you use uh, an x ray laser to make a molecular movie? Uh, and going through this in a, in a simple example of breaking a chemical bond in a small molecule, but the same principle can be applied to larger molecules and proteins. So we look at the example here of um, a light pulse from a laser shining onto a sample that, that has an organic molecule, 1,3-cyclohexadiene, and induces a, a bond break. And as a result, the molecule changes shape, right? One of the bond breaks and the molecule, their ring opens up, and you have a, a linear molecule, 1,3-5-hexadiene. And the question is, how does this process unfold? Can we, can we study this with x-rays? And as Megan explained earlier about movies, yeah, movies are really not, not that different from still images. Movies are just um, still images taken at different times of a, of a dynamic process. So we want to study how we get from A to B by, by taking images of intermediate uh, states during that during process. So how we do this x-rays is we can measure the starting structure time point zero. If we um, take an x-ray, if you take x-ray diffraction image of, of this molecule um, before the light pulse hits, the optical light pulse hits the molecule. And we do this not just once, we do it like, you know, 100,000 times to get, get to the structures. Every, each one of these measurements involves many, many thousand of diffraction images that get combined into one structure. And then we um, do a measurement where we shine onto our sample with a molecule with an optical laser, and then sometime later, we probe the structure with x-rays. In practice, it's actually the other way around. Since the x-ray pulses come at constant intervals at 120 times per second, which just have an optical light pulse that we, uh, that we start earlier and earlier before, before the x-rays. So we put a light pulse in, we wait a short amount of time, and then 
X-ray imaging gives us the structure at a time point one. The same, same works at a, a longer time delay between the light pulse and the X-ray pulse. And again, we do this thousand, thousand times for each one of these time points. And at the end, we have a final time point. And it doesn't have to be only three or four steps. It can be actually very many steps. Um, and then when we have these structures at different time points, we can put them together like a different photographs of the horse at different stages of the, of the gallop. And voila, we have a molecular movie. This is actually explained in a short movie that we, we have in Slack. My name is, uh, Mike. This is, um, My name is uh, Michael Manetti. I'm a staff scientist here at LCLS at Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, and I am the department head for the software trade department at LCLS. So we uh, here, at, for the very first time at LCLS, we have taken a molecular movie of a gas-based chemical reaction uh, using the ultra-fast capabilities of LCLS. We chose to look at and monitor a chemical by the name of 1,3-cyclohexadiene because the reaction is quite well known over the last 30 or 40 years uh, that this, this molecule undergoes a ring altering or a structural changing event when optical laser light is shined upon it. These type of ring opening reactions are very common even in, in natural product biology. But what wasn't known are the exact time scales at which how these structural dynamics occur and how the structure actually evolves in time. To take these images, we use a technique called X-ray scattering. As the molecules populate a custom-built scattering X-ray scattering vessel, as the X-rays progress through the, the, the target molecule, they scatter. And as the scattering pattern occurs, the X-rays or the scattered X-rays are collected on a large area uh, X-ray detector. So as these things scatter on the detector, the, their positions are very meaningful, and that's how you infer back what's going on in the molecule as its structure is evolving. So we produced the molecular movie by looking at a series of time-delayed pictures probed by the X-ray pulse. So we have an optical pulse that sets the reaction of foot, and then we come with this ultra-bright source in LCLS, and we take little snapshots at different time delays uh, between the optical pulse and the X-ray, that being LCLS. And then we sew these frames, individual frames, back together, and we were able to watch this chemical reaction unfold on a very fast time scale. This is on the order of 100 to 200 quadrillionths of a second, or a sliver of time, or 200 millionths of a billionth of a second. Cool. So that's a small, simple molecule, though. And what we are interested in is biomolecular movies. Um, like the small molecule and like the proteins that we saw during the crystal blaster game, some proteins can have their functions triggered with a pulse of light. Others can be mixed together with other biomolecules or chemicals um, to start their, their tasks, sort of like mixing reactants together to start a chemical reaction. Uh, Beta-lactamase is one of these, the protein we talked about earlier in the talk. When you mix this with antibiotics, the um, antibiotics are bound into the pocket of beta-lactamase and then broken apart. And this uh, protein and proteins like it are currently being studied using x -Vels. Uh, ribose switches are sort of folded pieces of RNA that change their shape when exposed to certain small molecules. So this is important because the ribose switch controls what type and how many proteins are produced by your body in the first place. So some of our friends at the National Cancer Institute recently did a study where they watched the shape of a ribose switch change as it was bound to a chemical called adenine. They did this by taking tiny crystals of the riboswitch, mixing it with adenine, and then waiting for defined periods of time before taking diffraction snapshots. So they were able to make a four-frame molecular movie of the riboswitch changing with time. The researchers used two pumps to precisely mix tiny crystals of the RNA segments, called riboswitches, with a special signaling protein, triggering the interaction. The mixture was then hit by an X-ray pulse from the LCLS, where the scattered X-rays were recorded by a detector and used to create high-resolution structures of the ribose switches. By allowing the biomolecules to mix for different periods of time, the researchers were able to take images at different stages of the process, but also enables researchers to study many kinds of biochemical interactions, which was not previously possible at LCLS. So, 
to sum up. Expels allow us to do science that would not have been possible previously. We can get high resolution structures of large molecules that are difficult to crystallize. We can collect that data at room temperature without worrying about collecting a damaged sample since the expel pulse outruns the damage process. And this means that biomolecules and small molecules are free to move around and have their dynamics. So we can collect molecular movies of this, these dynamics in action. For biomolecular movies, we're still sort of limited to a few frames, but the field is advancing quickly. And soon, we're hoping to be able to take molecular movies, even of single objects like viruses and these nanolipoprotein particles we study at Livermore that are little disks of cell membrane. So none of this progress would have been possible um, without the advent of expels. And a ton of work has been done at LCLS in the last 10 years. In fact, a lot of other expels are opening up around the world now and being built and proposed by different countries because the scientific community is realizing the power and potential of this technique. And this is all due to a, a huge effort of the large number of scientists that participate in each one of these experiments. Our group at Livermore has collaborators from all over the US and all over the world. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys for listening. And we are doing Q&A now. Yeah, we're happy to take any Disciplinary. Yeah. Right. So the, the teams that do this work right now um, have um, physicists, biologists, chemists, engineers, computer scientists, because a lot of disciplines coming together. Uh, there's a lot of engineering involved in actually building a machine like LCLS, a huge engineering effort. Uh, Livermore was involved in that as well in the construction and in the X-ray optics. Um, then in the sampling checking, there's a lot of engineering, a lot of ideas going there, how to make this more efficient. Um, the sample preparation is key because one thing we kind of glossed over a little is that you, you do multiple shots at identical objects or the objects that you image need to be fairly similar to each other. Otherwise, you can't combine the data. Right? They can be imaged from different orientations, but they need to be similar to each other, ideally identical. So sample preparation is key to make a pure sample. That's where the chemists and the biochemists come in. Biologists have the biological questions and they can produce different forms of the protein from different parts of a biological process. Um, the computer scientists help, help with algorithms and the data analysis. Um, so you need some education and usually there's a lot of PhD level scientists involved, but there's also masters and bachelor type people involved to do you know, some technical work. And we um, try to involve uh, young scientists in this work a lot, so there's students and postdocs. The BioExpo Center that Megan mentioned is actually an NSF, National Science Foundation funded science and technology center, and half of the funding that they give to that center um, goes to education, so there's educational outreach. There's a website, bioexpo.org, yeah, where there's more, you have that there? There we go. Yeah, yeah. bioexpo.org, where there's a lot of more information. Yeah, lots of good educational resources, both there and if you if you want some resources to learn about like protein structure in general, um, you can Google PDB 101. That's the Protein Data Bank 101, and there there's a ton of great resources there if you want to learn more about you know why we care about protein structure. Yeah. yeah. So um, LCLS was funded, I think, entirely by the Department of Energy. So SLAC is a Department of Energy national lab, so is Livermore, um, to build the machine 
and the first experimental end station was about 450, 500 million dollars. Uh, they profited from the fact that they already had a long accelerator from the particle physics experiments, so they repurposed part of that accelerator to, to produce an electron beam that then makes the x-rays. Um, the machine that just turned on in Hamburg, the European XFL, was close to a billion dollars. Yeah. So they're big machines. Yeah, it's, it's extremely expensive to maintain huge machines like this, but um, the type of x-ray pulses that we get from a machine like this are not, I mean, it has enabled us to do things that are hugely valuable, right? So I think it's a really good investment because it's a tool for other scientists to, to then take and use for all kinds of applications. Yeah. And what you say it's not only for biology. There's yeah. other experimental stations that look into material science, ultra-fast things. All kinds of stuff. So um, yeah, computer storage, for example, magnetic storage is investigated using this and many other chemical things. computational effort algorithms that are more efficient so you don't need a hundred thousand images but only ten thousand which reduces the measurement time reduces sample consumption so I think this is worked on from, from various angles so um, I'm going to take a minute and uh, announce the winners of our random drawing if they're still here Maddie Decor Sarah Stedman and Alondra Jacquez so if you're still here you can go ahead and get a t-shirt on your